Hi. Hello. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Lizanne. How are you? I'm great. I am so sorry. Please That's forgive okay. me. What a crazy ass morning all the way around. No problem. No problem at all. Is it traffic that kind of got in? No, what happened, first of all, my morning started, I had some, I was in New York for two weeks, and oh. New York and New Jersey, and I had a personal organizer who came in to do some work for me, and I think what, while they were moving something, they screwed something up, so while I was on my way out this morning, my garage is broken, so I actually left to go up to Harahub, my co-working space, and left my garage open, because I'm like, what the F? Oh no. And, yeah. So I was in a bit of a tizzy about that. And then I was up in Carlsbad and I was completely like smoothed out the morning, ready to go. And I'm like, okay, I have like 15 minutes where I can just sit yes. and, you know, go over some notes that I have and things I want to ask Camille. Yeah. And then I looked to reach for my mic that I, a second mic that I have that yeah. I can use there. And realized that in all of my tizzy this morning, I had left the mic here at home. So, so I'm like, I'm out. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole ass back down here. Oh, no. on a dress. I'm like, I can't even wear the dress. I just threw on a t-shirt. Yeah. Here I am. Here you are. You. <laughs> yeah, I know it happens, right? It's like one after the other. It just yeah. seems to have it be that way. But I, I totally you. understand. Thank you. I, I appreciate mean, it happens to me with my clients. So yeah. you're good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Of course. It. Just one moment. I just want to put sure. my headphones. Sure, sure, sure. Do whatever you need. Can you hear me okay, though? I can hear you perfectly okay. fine. I just want to make Can't. sure that okay. I am hearing you through the right device. Sure. Okay. So... Well, How is it over at Carlsbad? Um, in Carlsbad in general or? Just today. I love San Diego. So oh, I. do you? <laughs> yes. You know, really I San Diego, to. San Diego all the time. You know, all yes. The time. I own a, hold on, let me get this in. One second. Yeah. Let's see if I can get you in my ear. Oh. You're good. <laughs> You're so Okay. All okay, right. you're back. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, now let me just make sure that my, that I can, I know you asked me a question. I will get to that question in a moment. Sure. Okay, my microphone is going to be this baby. So my- I can hear the difference. Yeah. You can hear the difference. Okay, great. And now my ear, you need to be in my ear, I hope. Yes. Can you hear me? There you are. Perfect. Okay. All the things are working. I love it. I know. Um, uh, okay. What was your question? Oh, Carlsbad. So I oh, own yeah. a, I own a, um, a female focused, but gender inclusive um, co-working space and business accelerator up in mm. Carlsbad. And a friend of mine, Felina Hansen is the one who actually founded Hera Hub. Um, and I purchased the, um, Carlsbad location back in 2017. And so, yeah. And so it is a great way for me to connect with other entrepreneurial women and support yes. them and be supported by them. It's also um, a way for me to have some place to work where yeah. I'm paying for office space, but I don't have to just be sitting by myself somewhere. Yes. So. <laughs> ideal. Very ideal. All that. Yeah. All yeah. of that. Camille, how do you, Tenerife? Tenerife. 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 Yes. Okay, great. I got it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they will edit out all the gibberish because Tyler knows that. Okay, cool. Because yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all is, that's, yeah. Does this just happen naturally? People just have conversations like this that just go well. Sometimes they do. Yeah. Uh, and so Tyler will know and we'll pull all this out. So don't worry about it. And sometimes okay. he'll use, you know, some, you know, gander. Sure. Uh, as part of a promo, but he will absolutely edit all that out. So do not worry about okay, that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Tenerife. Let me just yep, you got it. Okay. Before we actually get into the official start, is there anything in particular that you want me to ask you about or that you want me to uh, mention or 
room that you want me to make for you to say something specific about something you have going on in particular? I don't know. I don't have anything um, going on right now. I'm just kind of doing the regular therapy stuff, but I could probably kind of maybe add it towards the end if there, if you kind of yeah, happen great. to add any questions that I think might be important for, for people to know. Absolutely. Okay. And okay. Ready? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sure you are. <laughs> I know. I am. Um, so uh, welcome to the Shaping Freedom podcast uh, with Lisan Basquiat. This is your host, Lisan. And I am joined today by uh, uh, um, Tyler. I'm sorry. You know, I'm freaking out today. I apologize oh. for this. Cut this one out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined today with an extra special guest. Uh, her name is Camille Tenerife. Did I pronounce that correctly? You got it. Okay. And Camille is a therapist uh, who is located uh, in Los Angeles and she works specifically with or focuses specifically on helping people of color to navigate the landscape of corporate life and all the things that go along with that. Uh, well, hello, Camille, first of all. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Did I get that right? You did. You got it exactly right. There are a couple of people that I see that I see come into my office a little or my virtual office a little bit mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. um, people who look like me and identify as same as I do, but I mm -hmm. do serve more of the uh, anybody that really kind of identifies with a uh, with being a, a person of color. Okay, great, great. And so I looked, I took a look at, we don't know each other. And this is actually the first time that we're meeting. Yes. So yeah, yeah. And I was, I'm really, uh, I don't remember how I, I think that Katie, Katie Armstrong is a uh, program manager uh, working on the Shaping Freedom team. And I think that she's the one who raised you as someone that we should absolutely have a conversation with. And I think it was because of, well, first of all, for the things that you just mentioned and the con the general conversation around mental health that I think is a very important one, always a very timely one and specifically right now. Um, but then there was also uh, some uh, commentary that I saw on your website where you talked about people identifying with their... Um, uh, how they're, they, you own your identity. Some, I think we, that you mentioned that people over identify with their ancestors. And so I really wanted to chat with you a little bit about that too. So we're going to talk about all those things. Okay, great. <laughs> My favorite topics. <laughs> I thought so, right? Mine too. <laughs> and so I, why don't we just start off with, um, Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to uh, do the work that you're doing. A little bit yeah. about your background story would be great. Yeah, sure. And I'm, I'm glad you're, you're actually wanted to address the first thing that you said, this is the first time that we're meeting, but I've definitely gotten to know Shaping Freedom and Katie did find me on a, a directory for, for inclusive therapists. And mm -hmm. just like you, I have really focused my work based off of my life experiences and what I thought I needed when I was younger, right? Yeah. This role model, people to validate my experiences, to give me some guidance, to really just hold space for what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. So just to give uh, the audience just a little bit more information about me, I identify primarily with being biracial. So I am both Filipino and Black, and my life experiences have definitely shaped the way that I see the world. Mm -hmm. So I have lived in the Philippines from four years old till I was about 16, oh. um, and I moved to San Francisco area Um for my junior year of high school. So you could imagine how tough that, that is. That is a tough to, transition. Yes. yes. Yeah, I went to an all girls private Catholic school my entire life. And so I didn't know what boys were. I didn't know what it was like to dress without a uniform. Okay. I didn't know going to different classes. I just didn't know any of that. And so 
all my focus was really just adjusting and fitting in as any mm-hmm. teenager would. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think that allowed me to, to have a lot of empathy for for different for immigrants, for people mm-hmm. who have moved um, in different places and not just different countries, but also just even if it's the next town over, mm-hmm. right, moving and that's in that way. So that's shaped the, the work that I do. Um, and also identity as someone who's culturally grew up in the Philippines, but presents as Black, right? Um, what is that like for, for me to navigate that and step into my identity? And that's continuing to change over time. So mm-hmm. I like to sit side by side with my clients as they kind of go through this process. Um, that's really kind of inspiring the work that I do. And I love it. I love it so much. It's awesome. So I want to talk about that transition to, you know, for a teenager into in the middle of high school. So I did a similar thing with my son Mm. and, you know, was very happy at the time with my ex-husband. We were really happy to finally be in a position to be able to move to the suburbs, right? Out of, you know, I'm from Brooklyn originally and, and all of that and was looking for something different and was really excited about moving out. You know, we were both really excited about moving our kids to New Jersey, which technically felt like a suburb of New York. Mm -hmm you know, <laughs> yes, it's a terrible thing to say, but that's how I felt <laughs> at the time. And anyway, I, um, but I remember my son being really upset about that move because of how huge a transition it was for him. It's just not the easiest time for someone to go, you know, from, you know, culturally, even though it's like from one sure. state to the next, sure. it was a huge culture shift going to school with people who had gone to school together, you know, for years. And now to kind of be sure. the new kid on the block. What was that about for you? How did yeah. you experience that? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty similar in that way. I was so resistant. Yeah. I did not want to. I remember crying at the airport and really just telling my my parents that I'm just going to stay back with my grandparents. It's okay. I don't have to go because of the relationships that I really established yeah. and the familiarity. And I'm also going into something that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't com- I can't really compare. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was definitely scary. Um, at that time, again, lots of resistance. I was very closed off, but the way that I managed it was to continue with keeping in touch with my friends in the Philippines, Mm -hmm. um, sharing my life experiences, uh, with them, describing what school is like and, and all of these, uh, different things that I'm observing Mm -hmm. and, and maybe this is in hindsight, but I just allowed myself to be a little bit different, um, you know, and, and, and understanding that, okay, I'm not going to be just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so that gave my, I kind of gave myself a little bit of permission to, to just get to observe what's going on. So I was definitely more quiet. I was definitely Mm -hmm. more on the observant part. I was kind of behind the scenes studying the, studying everything that's going on. It's probably why I got interested in psychology. Um, But it's really that connection with the Mm -hmm. friends that I have that really made, that got me through through mm-hmm. it all. Um, so that's, that's why I'm, I, again, probably now uh, thinking about it, why it's so important for me to, to, to do this work, to really mm-hmm. empath- empathize, emphasize to the clients that, you know, really connection is so valuable, mm-hmm. right? even in spaces where we feel like we're alone, as, as, even if we have those, bringing those old connections back into those new spaces, was mm-hmm. what, what got me through it. And how do you, how do, have you, in your experience, developed those connections? So I know there's like the connection to what you, the chapter you were stepping away from, and here you are at the time, you know, at the forefront Mm -hmm. of a new chapter Mm -hmm. that required some level of connection. How did you do that? Yeah, you know, I stuck with academics. I, 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 um, as, as you know, and I don't, I don't want to generalize, but there is this concept and talk about Asian parents being a lot stricter and more focused on academics. So that's definitely my upbringing from my mom. As soon as I got home from work, it's just homework all throughout. Um, Now thinking about it, maybe there should have been a little bit more balance, but that's what I um, held on to. So I just put a lot of my focus and attention in doing well um, in my academics. And I joined uh, National Honor Society and all this academic stuff. And that's really what got me to start making those connections with people. Um, and 
and and and now again in in hindsight at a time i'm realizing how i've over identified also with being um high focusing on being highly productive on overworking and that's why i resonate with a lot of high achieving professionals because i know myself like i put a lot of value in that because it's what it was my um my i guess the the bridge for me to kind of be be a customer um what's the right word i guess maybe connect to the new community that i'm stepping into yeah i think yeah. there's also something to accomplishment you know something to that feeling that sure. accomplishment brings that yes. can sometimes distract us from other yeah. things, you know, yeah. because that hard work and, and the fact that you can check things off and the fact that there's some control that you yes. can have in this thing that you're doing, whether it be your studies or your work or uh, whatever sure. the project is. Sure. Uh, there's something to that. Yeah. And, and add on the positive reinforcement that you receive from Absolutely. teachers and classmates and whoever, right? So it's yeah. more like, yeah, of course I'm going to motivate me to do better. Yeah. Right? So. How did you make the decision to become a, a psychotherapist? Um, it's, an, it's an interesting story. I've always wanted to help people. Um, I've always, I think that's also cultural in terms of um, being Filipino. A lot of uh, people, a lot of Filipinos identify with that nature. And so I want, first wanted to become a doctor and um, go into med school. And that's what I did in college until I got into organic chemistry and failed miserably. Oh, wow. um, and that was the door for me to start going to therapy. So I was first going to just academic counseling. I need help. I failed my class. What's going on? And then it led me to do real uh, actual like therapy counseling. Mm -hmm. And that's when I uncovered all of these things. And when I realized all of the things that my therapist had helped me go through, it was such a relief for me. And I wanted to, I realized in that moment that that's the way that I'd like to help, that there's a reason mm -hmm. why I didn't pursue this career. There's a reason why I failed my class. It was just really a redirection as to having a more positive impact on people's lives, because I know what it's like to sit in the client's seat mm -hmm. and how impactful the therapeutic experience was for me. Um, and really just, I don't want people to suffer alone. We're, we're, we are too similar in a lot of, we go through the same emotions, but we tend to keep them to ourselves. But if we just open up to other people, what we understand is that mm -hmm. everyone experiences it. And there's something yeah. to that in, in mm -hmm. knowing that you're not alone. So yeah. um, that's what drives, you know, the, the therapeutic work. Yeah. I love that. I also love what you mentioned uh, about the failure being a redirect. And was that an easy transition for you from doing one thing to discovering that maybe it wasn't the thing for you and then leveraging that to put, to propel you into something that was better aligned with who you are? Yeah, it was so difficult. It really was. Um, I think, I mean, you know, that starts when you're younger, right? Like people ask you or adults ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and then you have this thing in your head and you, you, I, again, over identified with that. That was the plan. I had nothing else in mind. That mm -hmm. was the plan. And so for my life plan to not go as planned, it was devastating. It crushed me. It, um, it's, Truthfully, and to be honest, since we're talking about mental health, it's what triggered me to go into depression. I isolated myself from my friends. I um, saw myself very poorly. I was just not, just didn't understand what was going on, but I felt off. Um, and, and that can't happen, right? When you expect one thing and then have it go the other way. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very, very difficult. And I would say probably one of the most significant moments of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that happens very often. And I think one of the, the things that I think is a bit of a challenge for people is this idea that at 18, 19, 20, 21, or 30, whatever age sure, you are, sure. that you make a decision and that's supposed to be your decision and you stick to it. Yep. Right. Yep. And life is a little more fluid than that. And mm -hmm. having as rigid an attitude as that can really choke 
the life out of your creativity yes. and your ability to, yes. to ebb and flow and to respond right. to different downloads that come to you or different ideas that sure. can be presented to you. And there are so many people that get so upset when yeah. things, you know, a relationship, a work relationship, yes. or, you know, a career path, as you as we were just talking or studies or anything, you know, or a plan to move here, wherever, mm -hmm. you know, people get mm -hmm. really tied up in that, and take it pr as a personal failure, when in sure. fact, it really is simply a redirect. Yes, yes. You know? And sometimes if you can just you know, accept the fact or consider the possibility that something that is not working out is a message for you to perhaps mm -hmm. go in a different direction. It would be mm -hmm. so much easier, but uh, there's a lot of struggle and resistance. There's a lot of pain in yeah. resistance. Yeah, there, there is, you, you have this tunnel vision of, mm -hmm. of just like, this is the goal I'm going for it, but you forget to see all of the peripheral and everything else that's coming yeah. up for you. And there's grief in that, right? There's yeah. grief in, in, in something not working out and it doesn't have to just be losing somebody. It mm -hmm. can be just losing the idea of what your life, you thought that your life would be. Right. And so it is, you're right, it is really difficult. Um, and in a way it's helpful to have goals, right? It's helpful to kind of move towards something and have some sort of structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's just making sure that we remain flexible because rigidity is, dysfun is dysfunctional. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not good. Um, it, it doesn't help us in the long term. Plus life is just not that black and white. It doesn't work that way. Nope, it does not work that way. Yeah, I think also, you know, in writing, I, a lot of the work that I do includes things like, you know, visioning and goal writing. And uh, mm -hmm. I have some pretty intense processes around doing that. And I think it's really important to have some clarity about what you want because so yes. often that is a huge question for people yes. and a hard, you know, we talk a lot about what we don't want. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you flip that question around to what you do want, there's like this deer in the headlights, like what? <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. oh. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that. What do I want? Ah, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the point is, is that when you're writing or coming up with goals or ideas about what you want, it's really important not to be attached to it. Yes. you know, to like, just give it your best shot, you know, connect yeah. your heart to it, understand your why and all these other things that help to support effective goals and plans. Yeah. And also understand that, you know, let go of the attachment to it. Yeah. You know, allow yeah. room for the magic that happens mm -hmm. in the world. You know, yes. imagine if you hadn't been in the situation that presented you with the ability to get a front seat view of yeah. what, you know, being a yeah. therapist might look like and right. how you could help other people. Right. And, and that's, I think sometimes it really is just, and I'm just remembering my experience. It's so hard to see the, the alternative, right? It's so mm -hmm. hard to see how it's going to work out when you're in it and you're feeling so, in, so intensely about the loss or something not working out. And so that's why talking to other people, talking to therapists, talking to your support system so that you can kind of press play mm -hmm. and, and see what else is going on and what else is going to happen for the rest of, you know, for the rest of your life. Um, but it is, it is difficult. Um, and also it's possible. It's mm -hmm. possible to see what else is out there. Absolutely. Camille, you talked about isolation and feeling a little depressed and kind of yeah. being at that time in your life. Can you talk a little bit about that and perhaps share with the audience um, some of what you did to help you to come out of that? Sure. I mean, in college, I, d I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. I, like I had no idea. I, there was a lot of stigma around. No, no one knew I was going to therapy. I would really just fake it to my, my peers and say that I'm going to class, but really I'm going to session. Wow. Um, I would take a couple minutes fixing myself in the bathroom after sessions before stepping outside on campus. So I really had no idea how to navigate that. Um, but I, I know what helped me were kind of having healthy distractions, right? Being again, the connections I'm, I'm very, um, connection driven. 
that's really, it's really important to me. So I, and I knew that from the beginning. So I really just capitalized on that. Um, and also labeling these things, knowledge, awareness. When I understood what depression was, it liberated me mm-hmm. because I now understand what this is, that there isn't something really wrong with me, that this isn't something unique that only I experience, that people go through these for these reasons. And so it's these, cl- I, I can recall the classes that I, that I were in sitting when I was studying some psychology, uh, taking some psychology courses and, and having these epiphanies and actually even holding back tears while I was listening to the sessions, or I'm sorry, to the lessons, because it so deeply resonated. But I think those tears were relief. I, in hindsight, mm-hmm. I feel like those were like, okay, wow, I, I can actually label these things and understand these things. Um, and so it's, it's important. I stress that a lot with, with my clients that, you know, diagnoses isn't you, it doesn't define mm-hmm. you, but it can be really helpful in understanding that you're not in this alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love this, this consistent theme of, you know, ensuring that your clients know that they're not alone. And I think that yes. that is the, for so many people, the beginning of the healing process you know, because mm-hmm. sometimes when we're depressed and when we're, fe- you know, when we are in that funky place, we isolate and we, yeah. you know, lean into the illusion that we're yes. just in this by ourselves and right. no one else in the world has ever experienced yep. heartbreak or, yes. you know, <laughs> yeah. job loss or, right. you know, adolescents who are driving you crazy or any of the things sure. you know, that are going on. And there really is something to the ability to actually speak that truth. Yeah. Yeah. So that you can move forward. Absolutely. And, and I want to add the caveat of speaking your truth to the right people, right? Yes. Because sometimes we can be vulnerable, share all these things, and then people can invalidate that, re-traumatize us. And so making sure that the spaces that you share these things in are also, um, you know, well thought out and people that have your best interests at heart, but absolutely. We yeah. really do experience experience it all. And so one thing that I hear to add on is just, I don't want to burden um, this yes. person. That's my problem. They already have a lot, a lot going on. I don't want to add on to their stuff. But they want to help and they see us yes. in pain. They see yeah. what's going on and they really just want yeah. us to open the door. It's about yes. you know opening up a door and allowing someone in. Right. What about, um, uh, I'm sorry, my phone rang. It distracted it's me. It's okay. It's okay. Um, this idea of... Um, We'll just move on until I can figure that one out. Sure. It comes back to me. Sure. In the meantime, I did want to ask you, I have a couple of things to ask you. I want to ask you about the statement about over-identifying with our ancestors. What do you mean by that? Over-identifying with our ancestors. I think in, in in, in the work that I do, I focus a lot on intergenerational trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and also focusing a lot on reliving the experiences that people before us have done and have exhibited. And I think that that comes up often in, in, in the room. With, with my clients. And that's why there is this importance of offering a new perspective. I tend to kind of, you know, look into values of clients, try and of what they have now, differentiate which ones are yours from that were handed over to you, from your culture, from people before you, from your parents, right? And which one applies to you now? Absolutely. Sometimes we, yeah, we over identify with something that's given to us, but it doesn't even truly, it's not ours anymore or it's no longer functional so teasing out the differences of like okay this was helpful for me when I was five years old now I can shed that and and adopt a new um, value or a new way of of managing life and and that's okay right like I, I learned what I learned I needed what I need I got what I needed to get from what my ancestors have shared with me um and and we get new information, we receive new information about our lives every second of every day. So we're allowed to change our minds. We're allowed to move differently than our ancestors have had, have done in the past. So I think it's really differentiating their own identity, but also not stripping, you know, what, what got them there. 
Absolutely. It's kind of like a hot potato. It's like, does this work for you? Yes. Put it in that bucket. <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. You have this. Does it work for you? No. Move it into the other bucket. You don't have right. to carry it along because you have your own stuff as well. And I think sure. what's also what you're also speaking to is this tendency that people have, you know, it left unchecked. Mm-hmm. We our lineage winds up being a huge snowball of things Mm -hmm. that just perpetuate from one generation to the next. And so what'll happen is you will raise your children almost as if they were there when you were a child, but they weren't, you know, you're not raising an older, a younger version of yourself. This is a completely new person with their own unique attributes, with their own personality, their own thing. And so I think that that's where the work that you do and the work that those of us who are focused on uh, healing and mental health, I mean, that's where the the value really comes in because it's about giving yourself the opportunity and granting yourself room on your own stage, the stage of your own life to figure out who you are and who you're not. Yes. Even if you've been behaving in a certain way, you know, it's really giving yourself that chance to stop, to say, okay, who's Lisan? You know, who's Camille? You know, Mm -hmm. you know, do I really like blue? You know, is that really my color? You know, is that really my profession? Do I really want to be a doctor, you know, or any of those things? And it's not a bad or negative thing against our ancestors. It's just, in my opinion, our right yes to own our own experience and mm-hmm. to claim our own experience and to be accountable for what's happening in our lives and you can only do that with conscious choice and deciding mm-hmm. that that's what you're that's going to be a priority for you yeah yeah absolutely it's i like what you you pointed out there that it's not wrong it's just it's just yeah. different right? absolutely it's just different you know, we all do what's best for us or what we believe is the right thing for us, you know, within our circumstances, you know, right. but today to walk around as if we're, you know, 40 years ago in some other world, the world's very different today, you know, and I think exactly. that's also what makes lineage rich. That's what makes our, our, and our lineage really, you know, filled with fire, you know, is the fact that yeah. we can be unique and we can actually take Absolutely. it and do with it whatever we choose to do with it. Right. In, right. including letting the crap roll along if that's what we choose to do, but at exactly. least own it, <laughs> you know? Exactly. It's it, There's room for improvement. There's room for, and that's what's beautiful about being human is that we don't have to create the same mistakes um, that our answers have created to learn a lesson from it. We could just mm-hmm. really reflect back and see how it worked, study it, and then to decide to, to to try it and do it differently, or maybe in a way that we think is better. And so I think that there's value in really taking, looking at um, ancestors and history and culture and all of that stuff, and then taking with us what works and maybe improving it, tweaking it some bit, and then being able to really continue that on so that the snowball effect becomes just better and we become better human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, colorful ball. Love it. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I wanted to, I know we're coming short on time. I wanted to ask you a bit about the career counseling that you're doing. And so what's interesting to me is the bridge between, you know, this work that you do on, you know, with individuals and helping them with the way that they're showing up in the world and to get rid of some of the things that are standing in their way. Talk to me about, or talk to the audience about um, career counseling and how that kind of fits into all of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, most of us have a 40 hour work week, right? And then so we spend a lot of our waking days, um, waking hours really working and, and focusing our, our energy onto work. So it is, it's what I have found what clients typically come in for is that this is happening at work. I'm, I'm not motivated or, or I have it all and it still doesn't feel good or something is wrong. I don't know what else to do. Lots of confusion. Um, and so what I find as you dig a little bit deeper is that there is some underlying stuff that's going on there, which just work becomes the, almost like a symptom of it. 
right? It's, it's stuff that's been going on in your life. And what usually will, will happen is that I'm noticing it in their friends. I'm noticing it in, in um, other relationships too. And so career counseling comes in as a tool in order for uh, clients to, to, a gateway for clients to kind of understand a little bit more about what's going on with them. And just to go back to what you said earlier, there's something about having a sense of achievement. Right, and accomplishment and having structure in your day and purpose and reason. So I think that having a job and careers are so important. And a lot of us identify with, with our careers or parts of our identity come from mm-hmm. our careers. So it's having a good relationship with it um, is kind of really the focus uh, focus there with, with some tangible things to work on for sure. Um, but really what you'll find is there's a lot of these thoughts and beliefs about work and, and ideas and emotions about that are just so charged that really doesn't, it's, it's we stay stuck in it. Um, mm-hmm. and so therapy allows us to, to move through that. And what you'll find simultaneously is just work as a microcosm of other things that's going on in their lives. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 It's like how you do one thing is how you do everything, you know? So if you are in, find yourself in combative situations on the regular at work, it's probably because you're in combat in other areas of your life, which really means that you're in combat on the inside. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You peel all the layers. Yeah. You get right. It's just me. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) In a way. And my saving grace. (laughs) <laughs> yes. um, in a way it is good though because it's still in your control if it Absolutely. comes down that it is about you then there, it is also you are also the agent of change absolutely absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. biggest issues that you are finding uh um just generally in the yeah. clients that you're working with what are the biggest challenges you know with it with working with um professionals there's a lot of I'm the only person of color or mm-hmm. whatever they identify with in my workspace. A lot of kind of um, oppressive workspaces by not listening to what their my client's needs are, overworking, mm-hmm. not allowing them to have a voice, not listening even when they express things. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's very, very common. Um, so again, it comes down to, to loneliness and not really identifying their own needs and, and giving themselves a, a voice because it's continually just shut down by the system, by the corporation, you know, mm-hmm. by the, the, the um, just the, the entire industry. Okay. So that's typically what comes up um, mm-hmm. for, for working professionals. Great. And outside of them reaching out to you, uh, directly if, you know, for some support. And I know that you're also working virtually now, yes, right? I am. In this yeah. new world that we all yes. have that has opened the doors and the roads for Absolutely. all of us to expand our, our presence. Outside of that, uh, any like tips or insight that you can give people who are in those types of situations that you just described? Yeah. Um, well, by first and foremost, I do want to say that it is complex. So there is so much more around it. And this is more, the things I'm going to say are just more general tidbits that mm-hmm. people can take. Um, I think that talking to other people about it, sometimes again, going back to the theme of what we've said, we feel like we're, we're the only ones mm-hmm. experiencing this. So finding mentors, colleagues, or just anyone that can really validate our experience. Mm-hmm. Having a healthy work-life balance is another one and understanding that I am just not blank, whatever role you're in. Like, I'm just not mm-hmm. a therapist. I am also a friend, a partner, mm-hmm. a sister, mm-hmm. a, a daughter, and, and maybe tapping into some of those identities as well and not having it all focus on work. Absolutely. Um, yeah, is, is another t- thing to find that balance. And I think the last the last piece is our con- just a reminder that this isn't this is, isn't just what life is, right? Like there is so much more to it yeah. than what we produce, what we check got or cross off our lists. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're not we're not our we're not our productivity. Yeah. Right? There's so much more to that. And we are worthy, even if we decide to sit on the couch all day. Yeah. 
Absolutely. the reminders yeah, of that, that it doesn't mean that my worth is tied into what I produce. And it's a chapter, you know, yes. it's temporary. It's temporary. Exactly. Even if it doesn't feel that way, you know, it's temporary. It's like stubbing your toe. It hurts mm-hmm. like hell for a minute. <laughs> and then you move on to other things and, you know, yeah. uh, so much of what we experience is like that. I remembered, and maybe we can end with this in a minute. Um, I remembered what I wanted to mention, and that is uh, venting. You mm. know, you mentioned venting and talking to people. And I wanted to um, mention the difference between venting, you know, which is great. You know, it's fun yeah. sometimes to sit around and, you know, chat with friends about things that are going on. Uh, and there also comes a time to actually take action, mm-hmm. you know, to call mm-hmm. someone to join a program, to do something about it, because venting is just the release of an emotion in the moment. It's not a solution, you know? And if you find yourself venting about things repeatedly, then it's probably time to actually do something about it, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. One phrase that I tell my clients all the time, if you want to change the way that you feel, you have to change the way that you're approaching things because the way that you've been doing it is not working. So we have to try something different. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where can people find you, Camille? You can check me out on my website. Uh, It is diversifiedtherapyla.com. And you'll find all the contact information there and and any other uh, tidbits about uh, career counseling, trauma for people of color Mm -hmm. and healing. Um, And and I think that's a good place to start. Absolutely. And who is your ideal client? My ideal client is if you are a a working professional that is having some challenges uh, around your career or just in your life in general, if you identify as a person of color, then I can most likely hold the space for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Are you on social media also? I am. I am on social media. My Instagram handle is heal.with.camille. Okay. Well, Camille, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me today and and sharing part of yourself and your story with the audience. Really, really appreciate it. And um, Yeah, please do reach out to her if you reach out to Camille, if you are finding yourself needing some support to get to the next side or the next step in your career. It does not have to be a struggle. It doesn't have to be painful. And walking around in pain is not what life is about. It's so much bigger, so much better than that. Yeah, Yeah. so reach out. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. It's our job to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Camille. Of course. Thank you.